and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to May 1984 and get all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games, we go ape over the best Donkey Kong clone, we review some older games, and take a look at some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine, and May 1984. Board game manufacturer Waddington has signed a deal with Leisure Genius to convert its popular board game Monopoly to several home computers, including the Sinclair Spectrum. They hope to release the game by July, in a bid to stop unauthorised versions hitting the shelves. In a brave move, Scion's managing director claims no one will be watching Wimbledon this year. Instead, he predicts they will be playing the new tennis game from his company. Simply called Tennis, the game will be released for the Spectrum in late May, well in time to drag people away from centre court. The Sinclair ZX printer is being phased out due to falling sales. The three-year-old device for the ZX81 and Spectrum has slowly been in decline and according to Sinclair is no longer useful due to the advent of Interface 1 that features an RS-232 port. This won't help ZX81 users however as they don't have Interface 1 and Sinclair have said they are not planning a replacement model or even planning to license the design out. On the plus side, the aluminium paper used will continue to be produced in limited quantities. A new television programme fronted by Fred Harris will aim to teach people how to program their computers. The show, called Me and My Micro, is due to be broadcast by Yorkshire Television starting Sunday 10th of June. The programme will include things like how to use subroutines and structured programming, amongst other techniques, and is mainly aimed for Sinclair Spectrum users and Electron users. Palace, the video and film creators, are to move into the computer market to produce various games based on its films. Palace will be the first company to do this, setting up Palace software and rolling out its first game, Evil Dead, across various platforms. Palace has the rights to other horror films too, like Basket Case and Chainsaw Massacre, so we may get to see these in the future, although the government are currently looking into rating systems for video games, particularly ones based on these types of film. The company set up by Clive Sinclair, Sinclair Vehicles, to produce a range of battery-driven cars has abandoned its plans to buy and use the former DeLorean car plant in Northern Ireland. The move has not stopped progress though, and it is said that the first product, a small, low-cost town car, is already at an advanced stage of pre-production. Sinclair Vehicles hope to launch its first car in early 1985. And that's all the news! And now on to the top-selling games. The charts are still clogged with big names, and most of the top spots are held by Jet Set Willy, Lunar Jetman, Hunchback and Scuba Dive, as well as Pogo and Alchemist, leaving very little room for newcomers. However, barging their way in this month are Blue Thunder, a helicopter rescue action game from Foundry Systems, later to become Richard Wilcox Software, Nasher, a Pac-Man clone from Mathertronic that was a re-release of an R&R &R game, and Escape from Krakatoa from Abex, another helicopter rescue action game. And that was the news and top selling games from May 1984. Donkey Kong, released by Nintendo in 1981, is a very early, and some might say one of the first platform games for the arcade, obviously taking into account Space Panic. It's also famous for introducing one of Nintendo's great gaming icons, Mario, to the world, although he wasn't actually called that in this game, he went by the name of Jumpman. This multi-screen game has you playing Jumpman, trying to rescue his girlfriend from the clutches of a gorilla. The gameplay is simple, move along the platforms, jump or smash the barrels, and climb to the top. It isn't as easy as it sounds though, but it's certainly addictive, giving Nintendo an instant arcade hit. The game also introduced other new elements to gameplay, such as conveyor belts and elevators. With so many mechanics to fit into a home conversion, how did the Spectrum do? With this particular series of tests ignoring typings, the first game is Donkey Kong by Ocean, released in 1986. This was Ocean's second Kong game, excluding the follow-ups of course, and this was the official license. As you would expect from an official game, it has all the features of its arcade counterpart, including all those little tunes, the levels and game mechanics. However, it does play slightly differently, just enough to make it that bit more frustrating, especially if you're an average player like myself. 
Maybe I spent too long on the arcade, but the speed Jumpman climbs the ladders is too slow and causes many a barrel to cause havoc on his head. I did try to work around this and spent over an hour playing this game, never managing to get past the first level. Compare that to the arcade game where I managed to get to level 3 after a few attempts and it becomes apparent that this version is more difficult. Graphics and sound are fine, although different versions of the game seem to give different amounts of sound. The one I downloaded had some missing, but the one marked plus 2 had the complete set, despite being a 48k game. Watching the RZX playback, as seen here, all the levels are present. It's just a pity that the game is too difficult and it won't let you get there if you're not a great player. Overall, a great clone, but you have to work at it. Next up is Gorilla, included on the Tate magazine Soft Spectrum from Spain in 1986. This game is obviously basic and comes with all the usual basic problems. Poor sound, slow controls and jerky graphics. Having said that, it's not bad to play, and at least I managed to complete the first level. There is only one level though, which keeps repeating, so not really a contender. Next is Killer Knight, released by Phipps Associates in 1984. If this is a machine code game, then there's something wrong with the coder. Although it doesn't have a gorilla, it is, at least in my opinion, a Donkey Kong clone. It has ladders, platforms, barrels, and a damsel to rescue. It's also a poor game. Awful sound, terrible control, and rubbish graphics. I think that just about sums it up. Next we have Killer Kong from Blabby Computers, released in 1983. This game has some of the main elements of the original, but there are some important things missing. For one, the player can't jump sideways, they can only jump up and down. This means things are a little tricky, and you have to think slightly differently about the path you're going to take. The control is quite responsive, and the graphics and sound are acceptable for 1983, but the battles do flicker very badly. There are multiple levels to this game, but they don't adhere to the arcade format. There are no conveyor belts, for example, at least up to level 6, where I managed to get to. The screen layouts change from level to level, with elevators being added to spy things up a bit. The barrels never drop down ladders, so this can be used to your advantage, and the ladders can be used as a safe place. A nasty trick of the game is not allowing you to jump through platforms, so you have to take that into account when you get into low spaces. This is usually always the case for the very last set of platforms and ladders. Once you get used to how the game works, it actually improves the gameplay, and there is a totally different strategy from Donkey Kong required if you want to get very far in the game. Overall, not a bad attempt by Blabby, and quite playable. Next we have Kong from Anirog Software, again released in 1983. Anirog were one of the companies producing a lot of arcade clones in the early days, and this is their attempt at something a little more complex than their average shoot-em-up. Initially the game was quite good, but as soon as the action starts, the flaws begin to show. After an irritating tune, the usual layout is present, although the girders are not angled like the arcade. There's also no introduction animation. The player movement is in character squares with very poor animation, and the control is just awful. The jump is nowhere near high or long enough to be useful, being just one character high, and the game ends up being a test of timing of jumps rather than involving any strategy. The whole thing becomes far too frustrating to play, and you end up swearing a lot and just switching off. The levels do change, but just with different ladder layouts and colours. There are elevators too, but no conveyor belts. The final level does include sections of the girders to be removed, which I suppose is a plus point. After many, many plays, I did manage to get to level 3 using an Infinite Lives poke, but it was still far too annoying to continue playing. This is Crazy Kong, released in 1984 on the tape magazine 1648. As you can probably tell, it's written completely in BASIC, and because of this, it suffers from all the usual problems. The control is awful, the graphics are slow and jerky, and the sound just consists of beeps. One to forget, really. Beep. 
Next we have Kong from Ocean Software, released in 1983. This is Ocean's first attempt at a Kong game. We've already seen the official release from 1986. Initially this looks like it could be quite a good game, having all the arcade levels, smooth gameplay and good sound. Sadly it's let down by very poor collision detection which ruins the whole thing. The introduction sequences, although different from the arcade, are present and you start off your journey in the usual way, and then things start to go wrong. The timing involved to make the jumps is far too limiting. That, linked with a bad collision detection, means that most of the game you'll be spent being killed on the first or second girder. I found using a joystick improved things a little, but then discovered another problem. Climbing ladders involves lining the player up accurately, or you'll just sit there waiting to be killed. Again, another frustrating point. As I played more, the gameplay improved as my timings got better, but it was still infuriating to almost complete a level, only to be killed because Jumpman wasn't perfectly aligned with the final ladder. Using the RZX recording, as seen here, the other levels look challenging. The game decided it didn't want to let me see them for myself. Not a bad game if you've got some patience. Next we have Crazy Kong from SeaTech, released in 1982. This, of all games I have played or ever will play, is the one I dreaded most. Everyone knows the graphics are rubbish, everyone knows the control is rubbish, everyone knows that everything else about the game is rubbish. Even the way it loads is rubbish. It asks you to turn the caps lock on before continuing, then plays a jerky animation, and then you have to press enter. It doesn't actually tell you this, you just have to guess. Then it loads the first level, and off it goes. So, with no preconceptions then, what is the game actually like? Well, in a word, rubbish. The graphics are awful, jerky and not animated. The control is terrible and the key layout is just impossible to use. It seems like it's compiled basic too. If you hold down a key long enough, auto-repeat kicks in. But this doesn't help this terrible game. There are separate keys for jumping left and jumping right and moving left and moving right, which is really weird. And when you climb a ladder, you don't actually climb, you just magically appear there. I don't remember magical teleports in the original. Mm. After a lot of playing, I decided to stop before I went completely mad. But all the time I knew I had to come back and record the video for the review. And it was whilst recording this video that finally, after over 30 years, I managed to get past level 1. Yes, that's right, I got to level 2. And I even completed that. But this is where the game's bug kicks in. Level 3 is unreachable and you just get thrown back to level 1. Level 2 is much easier than level 1 to complete. All you have to do is make sure you don't jump into the fireballs. At least I presume they're fireballs. I'm going to let this play through so you can see level 2 being completed and witness the bug as it loops back to level 1. But I even completed that again, whilst recording. Oh yes, SeaTech Crazy Kong God. I actually bought this game and still have the inlay and cassette to prove it, although the cassette was used as a blank after just a few plays. I think that really says everything about the game. Next we have Crazy Kong from PSS, released in 1983. This game featured all the levels of the arcade, including conveyor belts, elevators and removable rivets. The game begins with a terrible tune, if you can call it a tune, and then the action starts. Everything is smooth and the graphics are fine, but Kong does look like he's been overdoing it in the gym. The girders are not angled and are not even the right colour, but I suppose that's me being picky. The control is responsive, and for once the gameplay was forgiven enough to allow progress, and only punished you for bad gameplay rather than poor game mechanics. Early on I got to level 3, but the game was actually fun enough for me to want to go back and continue. 
You can also jump two battles at a time, just like the arcade game, something that the other clones don't let you do. The collision detection was good, the jumping was nice and smooth, the sound played its part but could have been better, and the tunes at the beginning and end could really be removed. I liked this game, I wanted to progress, I knew the limitations were with my gameplay and not the actual game itself or bad programming. Definitely one of the best so far, despite looking basic. Next we have Monkey Business by Arctic Computing from 1983. Initial impressions of the game are pretty poor and after a few plays it turns out to be just that. Gameplay wise it's not good. Control is hit and miss with the keys sometimes not responding. That makes things frustrating and the game is tricky enough without these problems. Conveyor belts and elevators are missing but the levels do change. That is of course if you can get there. Sound is poor with an awful tune and just beeper sound effects. Kong sits at the top of the screen looking more like a baby in a nappy than a scary gorilla. And your man doesn't so much climb ladders as slide up them. Overall then, a below average game with weak gameplay that leaves you feeling happy that you've stopped playing it. Next we have Ozo Bobo released on the Micro Hobby Tape magazine from 1985. Could this be classed as a type-in? I'm not really including type-ins, but then again you don't actually type it in. Anyway, it's basic, and it comes with all the trappings of a basic game. Probably best to move on quickly, although it is better than the C-Tech version. Initial plays seem to have no collision detection, and the up key didn't work. Oddly, when recording the video, both seem to work fine. Anyway, moving along, Next we have Donkey Ape, released in 1988 by Jaroslaw Pusko. I hope I pronounced that correctly. This is another basic game that doesn't even have full graphics. The ladders are made from letter H's and the barrels are open and closed brackets. As with most basic games, it suffers in every way. Time to move on. Finally, we have Wally Kong from Waltone Software, released in 1984, re-released later by Callisto and eventually Dixon's. Here we have an average looking game with girders that step up in character squares rather than pixels. This means there's additional jumping required. The graphics are quite nice and run smoothly, but the sound is almost non-existent. The version I downloaded seems to have infinite life set, at least on the first level. The game claims to have four screens with elevators and conveyor belts, but no matter how I tried, I just couldn't get off level 3. This is an almost game, it's almost playable, it's almost good, but not quite. So, after that mammoth testing session, and finally beating CTEX Crazy Kong, which game comes out the winner? This is going to be a tough decision because really there, there are two games to choose from. If you want a game that's close to the arcade but is very difficult to play, the winner is obviously the official Donkey Kong from Ocean. It's as close as you're going to get to the real thing if you can handle the frustration and difficult gameplay. If, however, you want something that's playable, quite similar to the arcade, but gives you that just one more go feel, then I think you're looking at Crazy Kong from PSS. Not as pretty to look at, but it has that something that keeps you going back. Anyway, why not download both of those games and make your own mind up? I've been a fan of pinball games ever since playing the real thing. As computers grew in power, so pinball games grew closer to the real thing, with Epic Pinball for the PC, Pinball Fantasies for the Amiga, and of course Arcade Pinball for iOS and Android. The Spectrum games were pretty poor in comparison, but imagine my surprise to find this game in the archives, a 3D pinball game for the Spectrum that actually plays quite well. There's only one table and the ball physics are sometimes a bit off, but this is a 48k Spectrum. The 
table is well designed with the usual pinball things like bumpers, ramps and special targets. A nice intro tune greets you before the game begins and the ball is sent into play by pressing a single key, rather than using the varying plunger that most pinball games have. The flippers are controlled by two keys and that's all there is to it. The table is presented at a good angle and everything is easy to follow. The flippers are responsive and the whole game is great to play with adequate sounds and bonuses. Like any table you have to get to know how the game works, what to hit for the best score and where to aim to achieve those extra bonuses. The magazines didn't give it good reviews but I think it's a good game and certainly passes half an hour and it's probably the best pinball game on the spectrum. So if you like pinball games on any other machine and haven't tried one on the spectrum yet, give this a go. As a shoot 'em up fan and former Amiga owner, Silkworm was one of the greatest games in my collection. Everything about the game I loved from the graphics, music, sound and gameplay. Originally released in the arcade in 1988, the Amiga version quickly followed and was one of my favourite games as I said before. The thoughts of this game on the Spectrum never crossed my mind, I mean, how could a Spectrum compare with a mighty Amiga? Well the answer is, quite well actually. The Spectrum version maintains all of the playability, which is hugely important for a shooter mode. The game lets you progress and the difficulty is set just about right. The graphics of course have been toned down, but they are well defined and smooth and mirror the Amigas. Sound again is toned down quite a bit, although the music is pretty good. The sound effects are limited to firing and explosions and the odd bonus sound, and it's probably the weakest element of the game. The Spectrum version even manages simultaneous two-player mode, quite an achievement. The only downside I could find really is that even if you select a single player game, both players appear on screen. It doesn't really matter though, it's still a great game, but it can be a distraction. Nearly all of the game's features have been included. Things like shields, which can be used as shields, or shot to create smart bombs, the goose copter, the megacopters and all the various attack waves and enemies. The only thing I could see that was missing was vertical missiles. I can't really praise this game highly enough. A fantastic conversion and just as a great shoot 'em up should be. Overall then, a fantastic game, especially if you're a shoot 'em up fan. This is King's Valley, released in 2009 by Retroworks. Originally this was released for the MSX computer by Konami in 1985, and it's an Egyptian themed platformer, which brings many other elements into play to produce a wonderful and challenging game. You play Vic the notorious adventurer, and you have to explore the hidden chambers and collect all of the gems. Obviously it isn't going to be that easy and there are plenty of mummies around to guard those gems and stop Vic getting them. Once collected, the door will open to the next chamber and you can move on. To help Vic, there are several things scattered around the chamber. Things like pickaxes, which can be used to dig holes to get to hard placed gems. And you can also pick up swords that can be used to dispose of the chasing mummies, at least temporarily. The game is an absolute masterclass of how to produce a great looking, great sounding and great playing game. The graphics are clear, smooth and often comical, the music suits the game well and the sound effects are spot on. Gameplay wise it's not actually a walk in the park, it's pretty tough and it took me a while to complete the first level, but it never seems to become frustrating and you always want to go back and just get that little bit further. Which order you do things in and what you use to achieve it is totally up to you, and you eventually learn the best way. Sometimes it's easiest to collect gems that are encased in stone first, other times it's not. It's all up to you. I 
hadn't seen this game before this review, but I'm glad I managed to find it. It's an excellent all-round game, and highly recommended. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon!